What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Resource Podcast. This is a very special episode that normally we would only post for our Patreon members, but it was a really good recording, so we wanted to share it with everyone on YouTube in its full entirety. So normally our episodes are about one hour long, sometimes a little bit longer, and we only post half of it on YouTube, but this is a really good episode, and it includes a lot of the inner workings of how eBay works. So Typically, this is stuff we discuss inside of our group, but this was a good one, so please make sure you listen all the way to the end. We appreciate you guys, and please join our Facebook group at patreon.com slash podcast For $35 a month or about a dollar a day, we promise that you will earn more money and save more time, and everyone in there is serious, and we do reselling not as a hobby, but as a business, so we appreciate you guys. See you inside the episode. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Resellers Podcast. This is a bonus episode for our Patreon members only. Today, we want to talk about building value for your customer. And a lot of resellers in the group are talking about building a business that fits their needs. And maybe they're not thinking about the end customer. But if you focus on providing value for the customer, they will always buy from you and continue to buy from you. Correct. And eBay is currently setting it up so customers can come back and buy from us with ease by doing the coupons, by doing all the promotions that they're rolling out. And the previous CEO did not have such an importance on return customers. They just wanted all customers, Um, whether they spent $1 or $100. The biggest metric for the previous CEO was just number of customers. But this, um, this organization that's ahead of eBay right now, they are stressing the importance of a quality eBay customer and a repeat eBay customer. So a quality customer for them is one that spends $800 on the platform or shops six times a year. And they want the repeat customer. So as everybody knows, they are rolling out the coupons. They are allowing us to send coupons out when we send offers. And they're also going to be rolling out coupons in bulk to the customer. So like you said, um, it doesn't matter a lot of things that are talked about. It only matters that we're doing the best job that we possibly can for our customers. And if we do a good job for those customers, eBay is rewarding us and returning them back to us instead of back to ebay.com by saving us as a seller and offering them the incentive for our stores only by providing them with a coupon. And this is the secret to selling things faster. If you decide that you're going to pick only selling one category, you can provide the best buying experience for that customer because you know what the best buying experience is for that customer. You know, there's people who sell record players and they upload a YouTube video of the record player uh, functioning and working, working, and that might be necessary for a $500 item. And if you're selling a used piece of clothing, you want to have as many pictures and from as many angles as possible and you want the condition described. Correct. You, you want to have as many photos as possible. You want to have the most accurate description, the most accurate title, the most accurate item specifics, along with a very generous return policy, good feedback, and a very quick handling time. If you do all of those, that is a quality listing. And we talked about it last night. A lot of people ask, what is a quality listing? And according to the um, listing quality report that's provided by eBay, it ranks you all across eBay on where you are in that category. So some people are number one, some people are number four, number 10. That's based on the GMV, which is the gross market volume, value of sales during that time frame. So strictly dollars, how many dollars did you sell in that category? And that's how they rank you. But that says nothing to what exactly is a quality listing. If you scroll all the way to the right on the listing quality report, it gives you the metrics on which our listings are measured by, ranked by, and searched by. And it gives you the top 10% of eBay sellers in that category, how they stack up against you. And I think that probably 90% of eBay sellers are not serious sellers like we are. Maybe some of them have not logged in for the month. Maybe some of them have not logged in for this week, but they're still being compared to us. So I think in order to have a quality listing, you must exceed the top 10% of eBay sellers in your, in your category, according to the listing quality report. So how many pictures does the top 10% of eBay sellers have? If it's 8.7, you have to exceed that in order to have a quality listing. 
you should have nine photos or 10 photos on average, how many keywords you should exceed that. You should exceed the return policy. You should exceed, um, if you're running a promotion, you should exceed every single category that eBay is measuring us on if you truly wanna have a quality listing. And what that translates to for the customer is, if they're looking for an item and you have all the keywords, no, no matter how they search for it, they find that item. So the customer may be looking for a pair of free people jeans. And we did that example where we looked for this, this seller's free people jeans and we were not able to find it. Even looking for that specific pair of jeans, we couldn't find it because the item specifics were made up. Right. So we, that's important. In this group, we do not recommend making up an item specific if you don't know what it is. Correct. And you and I, we spent five minutes trying to look for that particular listing. Mm -hmm. We were not searching eBay. We were literally trying to look for the listing and we could not find it. So if your item specifics are not correct or they're made up, it is very difficult for a customer to find the item because we were literally trying to find that item and we could not find it. So that is the importance of item specifics. That is the importance of left, left hand navigation. And that is the importance of learning about the items that you're selling. Because if you can list a quality listing as fast as possible, because all of your processes are streamlined, every time you can increase how many listings you can do per hour, you give yourself an hourly raise. And it's not a $1 raise. It's not a nickel raise like they tried to give me when I worked at CVS back in the day. If you can list one more item and your average sale price is $20 and, and you net 12 or you net 15, you just gave yourself a $15 raise per hour over the course of an eight hour day. That's, that's hundreds of dollars in increased wage just by streamlining your processes, learning how to list a quality listing faster and correctly. Because if you have to spend time doing a lot of research, you have to spend time, you know, finicking around inside of your process, it's going to take longer. And the goal inside of the group, we say it all the time, is we want you guys to get done with your work sooner. So you can either go do something else that you enjoy, or you can get more done in the same amount of time. This is really important because when you deliver a quality experience to the customer, your turnover rate is much faster. So this is important if you want to save space and you want your items to sell faster. If you think about from the customer's perspective, you basically, basically need to get them exactly what they search for. And that will result in a sale as long as they feel like it's worth more than what you priced it at. It's, it's a very yep. difficult for a customer to look for a pair of free people jeans and they want to pay $20 for it. The market says $20 for it and yours is $21. Right. It's extremely difficult for them to pull the trigger. Right. But if, if their value and their opinion that those jeans are worth 25 and you're asking 20, yep. you will close that sale every day of the week. That's mm -hmm. sales 101. Whether you're buying a car, whether you're buying a house, it doesn't matter. But you touched on something very important that I don't think we've ever talked about. And I don't think anybody on YouTube has ever talked about the importance of turning over your inventory. If you don't turn over your inventory fast enough, that's when you need to upgrade your storage. That's when maybe you need to move to a move out of your house and into a storage unit. That's when you need to consider getting a warehouse or something like that. But in your little store, your sell through is so fast that you can have a thousand item store in 10 square feet in yep. a corner of a bedroom mm -hmm. because you're doing all the things correctly for those items to sell as fast as possible. And if you list 10 items a day and you sell seven, you're only net three. And as yep. your store grows, you can continue to list 10, then, then you'll, then you'll sell eight, then you'll sell nine, then, then, then you will sell, then you will be at reseller Nirvana, 10 up and 10 down. And your your storage situation never increases as long as you're 10 up or and 10 down or if you're 10 up and 7 down your storage doesn't increase dramatically very fast you, you can you can still work in a corner of a bedroom for many years if your inventory is turning over so the difference between your store that's brand new and my store you have a sell through rate that's incredible right now for the little store mm -hmm. um, how many items are you on now 110. 110. So 
I have the same store inside of my store Mm -hmm. of 110 items that sell tremendously like crazy. That's right. But I also have 110 items in my store that is going to take nine months to sell. That's right. Because I have a vast majority of different kinds of little stores within my big store. So that's right. I have I have the hundred item store that sells a hundred every month. I have the hundred item store that sells ninety every month, all the way down until the hundred items that might sell five a month, ten mm-hmm. a month. And as you grow, you have to start casting a wider net because nobody can point us in the direction of hundred items that is going to sell a hundred times a month, thirty thousand item store. That that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So as you grow, you have to be less picky. Maybe you start introducing items that have flaws that aren't going to sell as quick, maybe different sizes, like an extra small, maybe certain colors like red, red gel is very slow for me. But if you can keep your store at a manageable size, then your focus can be the turnover. And like you did the calculations in one of your recent YouTube videos, If you could do it by yourself and turn your inventory like crazy, you can make a boatload of money. You know, when you look at the sell-through rate and you decide what items you're going to sell, let's say if you sell $100 bills at $75, those will sell immediately. And I think it's, it's important to understand when you're an expert, you know how long things take to sell and you might pick up an item that doesn't meet the profit average you're looking for but it exceeds how long you're willing to wait. If you're okay waiting three months for an item to turn over and you find an item that turns over in two weeks, you might accept one third less profit and be fine on your margin. If there is an item that is difficult to replace and you find a $500 item, maybe you're willing to wait three years to find the right buyer for that one and you can't replace that rare, unique one of one item. So it's very difficult to have only home run items that take 10 years to sell because there's not cash flow. And it's very difficult to grow a store that has an insanely high sell through rate. You sort of just make the same amount of money because the store stays the same size. There's a balance. Yeah, there is a balance. And also we are kind of at the mercy of our sourcing route. Um, We're only presented with the items that are presented to us because we don't order skew from a website per se if we go to the thrift and we're having a horrible day, I've done it before. You start buying items that maybe you normally wouldn't buy if you were having a great day on the route. And, you know, that takes a little bit of discipline to say, you know what, maybe I shouldn't buy this item just because I'm having a bad day sourcing. But also at the same time, I have this listing goal that I have to meet. So like I need items, whether they're going to sell in three months or three days, I would love to have a three day turnover. But unfortunately, I'm having a tough week finding items. So my net just got a little wider. Like we talked about, we're all out there looking for the gold. Sometimes the silver is great. Sometimes the bronze is great, but sometimes we got to throw some aluminum up and, and, and when you're out there and you're getting aluminum because it does still sell in turn, you know, a reasonable profit, you have to also take into account the cost to store the items because that is a cost as well. If you're paying warehouse, if you're paying storage, every single item that sits in there is a running cost of overhead. So there is that balance that you talked about of getting the items and turning them over in a reasonable time frame. So that way you don't have, you know, a 10,000 square foot building of all items that sell once every 10 months. That is not a good recipe for, you know, a, a online reselling business. I can give you guys a specific example. So right now, a gold item, in my opinion, is anything Ivanka Trump related. She's in the media a lot. Her clothing line has been discontinued, so it's a little bit more rare. So they sell quickly. Now, here's the thing. One thing you can do is you can sell a gold item for a bronze price. If you want something to move quickly. So here's an example. I found a yellow Ivanka Trump dress that had a spot right on the shoulder. So automatically, if you had a I want to only sell the premium stuff, only the gold stuff, you wouldn't buy it because it doesn't match. It will not fetch the high price. But what I did was I picked up that dress, listed it at $14.99, even though ones that are not staying might be $20 to $30 plus shipping. 
listed it for $14.99 the first day somebody offered $11.99. And I took the deal and turned that item over, let the customer know there's a spot on the left shoulder. If you want to rehabilitate this item, you just got yourself a, a gold item for a bronze price. You can do that. Lots of sellers sell damaged, broken, missing zipper, North Face. This missing zipper North Face will still sell. I, I, I've sold those in the past many times. It still yeah. does sell because they also have a very generous warranty that mm -hmm. if somebody does want to get it fixed, they can. But a lot of people wear their jackets without a zipper and they're fine with that and they're happy to get a North Face on a deal. That's but right. I think, I think this conversation right here, a lot of people, even in the Facebook group, are struggling with this right now of afraid of not getting all the money. So for you to pick up an item and sell it for $5 under market price, like you still have a pulse and you're still alive and you're yep. still able to list more items for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So like I haven't been able to diagnose the disconnect of being too scared to not get all the money. Mm. That, I mean, I'm not scared of getting all the money. I'm scared of running out of space. So looking at that, trying to get all the money requires you knowing everything about the item. And that's very difficult. But even if you know everything about the item, it yeah. doesn't guarantee you're going to get all the money. That's true. So if you want all the money, what would be the pros of getting all the money? Because I know all the cons. The cons are it may take longer to sell. The cons are you have to store it for longer. The cons are maybe you have to do a bunch of extra research to gain that extra knowledge to command the top dollar. The cons are you become very emotional in the sale and in the item. What are the pros aside from getting all the money? It's the fear of missing money. People are scared of losing money, so they don't, they don't take that deal. But I feel like you know, a bird in the hand is worth more than two in the bush. That concept is, I don't know. It's really hard to get all the money, period. It's on it's e-commerce. Trying to sell something at full retail is, even if, even if you are the manufacturer of the item, you can't do that sometimes. <laughs> they still discount and they blow it out at TJ Maxx. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because may, maybe that's the way it is. Because like, we all can go into our performance tab. And if you scroll down about halfway, it's going to tell you how many items you sold at full price. What's the percent of items you sold at offer? What's the percent of items that you sold seller initiated offer? All right. A real brand like Nike, they make all their money on full price sales, mm -hmm. but they also have a division of items that go to TJ Maxx. That's right. They also have a division of items that go straight to clearance. B stock items, B grade items, variants. All those sales that we sell at full price with no offer, we're making all the money. But like, why can't we sell a percentage at a TJ Maxx discount price? That's a that's a great analysis. We need to have we have, I mean, we have items that sell for all the money. All the we, money. All, but we also have items that sell for half the money. What about this? How many items do we have that sell for all the money plus $10 above market? Yeah. Those Does anyone too. calculate that? People never feel bad and refund the customer because the item right. sold for two bucks over what they, what they think it was worth. Never. But how many times does it happen? It happens all day. All day, I will sell an item for over market. Yeah, for one happens. reason or another, maybe because it was presented higher in the search, maybe because I'm closer to the person, maybe because the person liked me, maybe because the person liked my username. It doesn't matter. But like you said, we don't go in there and refund them because it's above market. So like the point I'm trying to make is like all of this stuff averages out for Nike. It all averages out, whether it goes to the website, whether it goes to TJ Maxx, it doesn't matter at the end of the year their ledger is way in the positive. That's a great we, point. We can't live and die on getting all the money. Like at the end of the year, are you in the positive? Yes or no. If you're not in the positive, it ain't because you didn't get all the money for, for your items. That's not the reason. So 
Here's an example. Calvin Klein, one of the biggest companies in America. Some people in the group have been saying that Calvin Klein comes after them when they sell brand new Calvin Klein. And um, that can happen with any brand. I want to reiterate that you mentioned that every single brand is the verified rights owner and they can take whatever actions they want. But Calvin Klein, on it, for example, on average sells for about 20 bucks across the board. That includes they took out a full page ad in Times Square for Justin Bieber to sell something for $5,000. But after all said and done, because they had to sell two truckloads of TJ Maxx for $4, it all averages out to $20. No, all the high end and all the low end, when you add all that together, it just ends up being the same as what every single long-term company does. It's like $20. Right. And for your new store, your average cost of goods is what? Two bucks, two to four bucks. And your, your average sale price is what? 30. If you don't know that information, maybe you're too emotional. And that is a huge, that's a huge concern that happened in the, uh, in the call this morning, we were asking, do you like the items that you sell? Do you have to cherish it? Do you have to look on it? Do you have to try it on? Right. So if, if you don't know your average sale price and your average cost of goods, you can get caught up in getting all the money. That's right. I know my average sale price. I know my average cost of goods. Mm -hmm. So I know my threshold in an acceptable range of an offer that I can accept. That's right. And by looking at it, just by looking at the numbers, it does not matter if this North face is purple instead of pink and purple commands 18 more dollars. It doesn't matter because my average cost is $4. And if someone sends me an offer for 20 or 25 or 30, it's out the door and onto the next person. I don't need 49 99 mm -hmm. because I can go out to any thrift store in America and find another North Face jacket. Here's another problem. You're asking for all the money. Someone's not asking for all the money competing against you. Right. And the <laughs> stores that are bigger tend not to ask for all the money. That's because true. Because they can absorb not taking all the money by selling more items. And I finally figured out a few years ago is this very simple concept the more items that I sell, the more money I make. Because I might make $5 on this item, $27 on this item, 13, 85, 200, 4, 6, 27. But at the end of the year, it's all an average and it's all an average in the positive. So this is an interesting example. Locally, the, the Olympic Club golf course is one of the biggest um, golf courses in the world of member wise it has 10,000 members. Now this is interesting in the pro shop. When you go there, everything is marked 20% down. And my brother who used to work there, I asked him why that is. And he said that the person that runs the merchandising shop said, I don't need all the money. I need them to shop here. That makes sense because they can buy goods anywhere. So He's trying to keep the retention, the people who are already there. eBay gives you a certain amount of traffic. If they don't buy from you, they're going somewhere else. You only get so much traffic. Right. And this is a guy merchandising in a brick and mortar store to select clientele who can't walk out the door and go next door for club gear. Yeah. But on eBay... They could just click the back button and they're on to somebody else. That's right. So it's even more important to be in the game on eBay because all they have to do is click the back button and they can go on to another seller who maybe they're having a bad day and they haven't sold anything all day yep. and they'll accept the, and, and, and they will accept the lowest of the low ball offers. Or they'll go to someone like you where your average cost of good is $2. Right. And you don't care if you're getting $27 or if you're getting $18. A sale is a sale. And at the end of the day, if you are not getting sales, you are not making money. If you are getting sales, you are making money. Not a single person in the group has posted yet, I'm making more sales, but I'm making less money. Can somebody look at my store? It's always the opposite. Never. I, I've never met the person that says they're selling more items, but they're making less money. It, it can't happen. It, it's, um, 
And I think that a lot of people are taking offers the wrong way. When somebody offers you $10 for a $24.99 item, somebody else is going to take that deal. And if they've offered someone $10 before and that seller accepted, that's sort of their new threshold. That's why it's important, in my opinion, not to decline that offer because somebody else took that offer. Because I've gotten the message before. I just bought this same shirt from somebody else for this price. And you can go back and say, well, maybe it's a different condition. Maybe it's a different whatever. But probably they're not lying because there's so many other people selling the exact same things. What if somebody's just selling it from their own wardrobe? Right. Do they, do they really care? Right. Or maybe the customer only wants to spend $10 because they think your item is only worth $10. That's true. And let's be real. We bought this stuff at garage sales or flea markets <laughs> for less than $10. So tell me how it's worth more than that. Just yep. because we took a photo and we presented it on eBay, now it's worth drastically more, three times, five times more. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean anything. They can also walk into any thrift store in America and find the same Donald Ross polo shirt you're trying to sell for $27. <laughs> it's true. I think that's right too. Some people only have a certain amount of money. And it's important to look at the price buckets. You had Isaiah pricing items at $20.79, how many people filtered out his result by selecting $19.99 or under? Mm -hmm. A lot of people shop that way. I would say the majority of people shop that way because to me, $20, that's money, $19.99, that ain't as much money. Mm -mm. And just psychological like that, it is different. So if you price your items at $20.10, you may literally not be on that person's search. And I would, I would raise the argument, aside from a select few brands like Arteryx, that you can get every single brand of clothing on eBay for under $15. 99% of clothing items you can find for under $20, you're right. No doubt. So why are our items exponentially more expensive or more important. Like we talked about, there are the buyers that will come and pay us all the money, all the money plus $2 as well. But there are customers, maybe the majority, according to the, the, the traffic tab that say, that show where your sales came from. Did they come from full price? Did they come from best offer? Did they come from seller initiated offers? And most people are selling items buy best offer or seller initiated offers rather than straight up full price. So what makes it so valuable just because it's ours? I used to think like that when I first listed on eBay too, like, oh, I have this hat. It's the best one on eBay. So I deserve all the money. But how long do you look at the hat or how long do you look at stale sales or how long do you not run a, a markdown sale? How long do you not do a coupon how long do you keep bickering back and forth for $1 on offers before you decide that that item is really not that important? And I probably should have sold it six months ago because now I'm selling it for 20 where six months ago, someone offered me 25. No one keeps track of that metrics e either. I think on that same point, let's say there's a women's shirt that Michelle brought up on the women's clothing call called the Express Portofino shirt. I've seen it before thrifting and it's, it's a popular style for, for women's clothing. Are you going to get really that much more money than a button down express women's shirt? Not really, even though it's really, maybe it's on point and it's trendy. It's not that it's not like you're going to get triple the money because you know, it's the Portofino model. I think a lot of people get caught up in identifying exactly what they have. Yeah, and, and like getting all the money is probably $5 or less on average per item because that Portofino shirt is not going to be worth $40 all the money when the market, when the going rate is $20. That's right. So, so like what are we really holding out for? Like we're holding out for dollars. Like most people wouldn't even pick up the amount of money that we're holding out for if they saw it on the street. But on eBay, we have to hold out for this $2.50 on, 
or else we're not going to make the sale. If you think about it on an average, I think that's maybe the secret for, for you and I not deliberating over this. We don't look at each individual transaction. We look at it as a whole. At least that's, that's how I look at it. Yeah, definitely. Because I, I have the margins that I want to make. I have, you know, for certain brands like a North Face, I want to get, you know, at least $20. That's where I'm really happy. If someone offers me $18, i am not going to counter back at $19.99. I'm going to make the sale for $18 and I'm going to reinvest that $18 back into three or four more items. And I'm going to do it again over and over and over again. Whereas I would have held out and counted back at 1999 because that was my actual price target. What is the opportunity cost that you lost by not being able to redeploy that $18 into more inventory? And then, you know, it's exponential. You, you sell one, you buy four, you, you sell four, you buy 16, and then you buy 32, and then it just goes up and up and up. But, you know, if, if you're sitting on your one over $2, the opportunity cost is the four items, is the 16 items, is the 32 items. Relatively fast compounding. I have a good an example of this. We had a gentleman that was selling returns, Amazon returns on eBay in a pair of Nikes, maybe on Amazon selling for a hundred dollars, but it gets returned. So he's selling it for $69.99 on eBay and basically crickets, no sales. And if you have a buy it now offer and there's no best offer on eBay where it's a different marketplace than Amazon, no one can offer. And people keep coming to the listing and then bouncing, meaning they don't convert. You can actually see that in the traffic tab. Mm -hmm. So when you looked at that and you were saying you need to, you need to retain that customer, you now developed a reputation with eBay that somebody goes to this store looking for items that are $20 and half the time they leave with the item for $13 plus shipping. And the algorithm will start picking up that. And they might even give you more customers because it's amazing how many offers I get between thirteen and fifteen dollars. It's like, it's like that's that kind of customer was just given to me. They see something for twenty to twenty four, and they offer thirteen to fifteen. Right, and eBay has just as much data on the customer, if not more, than they do on us sellers. So eBay knows exactly the habit. Mm -hmm. of where the customer clicks, what kind of items they want to buy. They know their purchase history. They know if the buyer is a deadbeat. They know if the buyer is going to send you an offer or if they're going to buy it straight, buy it now. They know all that information on the buyer because they're spending, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars per year trying to acquire that customer. So they're not going to send a customer to our listings that has a low chance of converting. So, if the customer that came onto ebay.com and is looking for a Nike shirt and their whole time that they've ever been on eBay, they've purchased 12 items all by best offer. They're going to present them with items that are affordable, that have the best offer. If they always just straight buy it now, just totally disregard the best offer, maybe best offer having it on your listing is not as important in the search criteria to that buyer. If they have a buyer that just comes on and always clicks the promoted, the most expensive one because they have more money than time or more, or more money than cents, they're gonna give that buyer the highest one promoted listing so they can get the most fees for that customer. Mm -hmm. They have all of this data for all of this stuff. And because they do have this data and the buyers have the freedom to shop, makes it all the more important that we are presenting the buyer with the most accurate item that they're looking for at the best price. Because if we're not, then eBay has spent money acquiring that customer all for nothing. So they're not going to present a bad item at a bad price with no returns. You have bad feedback. Um, you have one photo eBay doesn't have any incentive to present that item to a customer who is trying to go on eBay and spend their money. 
you know, I wonder if this has to do with anything with the listing daily. If you list daily, you're probably more likely to provide a good customer experience. It's got to be related. Absolutely. Not only that, if you list daily, you're more likely to be open for business and at home. Mm. Like at home on eBay, not at your physical house, but I'm here, I'm home. So if someone wants to send me an offer, eBay knows I'm here every single day. I cannot imagine that if you list once a week and you only touch the computer once a week, I cannot imagine eBay is going to give you a lot of best offer traffic. Because why would they? The offer is going to expire in 24, 48 hours. And that's a horrible and experience. Horrible experience. Yep. And, and if the customer is waiting there for 48 hours and never hear back, I'm just going to go to Amazon. Yeah. Or if the customer is waiting for 48 hours and you're not replying, but they send a message to, to Chris and Chris will reply within 10 minutes, that's the, that's the engagement that they want with the buyer. Like everyone's focus is social media, but like eBay is also a social media. Like they want to know that you're going to interact. They want to know that you will do this and you will do that. I don't believe that they want you declining offers when a customer sends it, because to me, that's a bad experience. A customer wants to pay this price, straight decline, no communication. I'm going to go elsewhere. But if you counter me back, you've engaged with me. Maybe I'll spend another $2. Maybe I'll spend another $5. But if you straight decline on me, I'll go to Amazon. I'll just buy it. That's right. I think shifting the focus of the customer is where a lot of people go wrong. That's where you made your turn when you asked your wife what was better and your wife told you it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what your customer thinks. That's right. That's where you hit the final lap. And that's when everything changes, when you got in the mind state of what is best for the customer. We talk about it all the time. What's best for the customer is what I talked about in the first two minutes of this podcast. Everything that has to do with the listing quality report. What's best with the customer is an attentive eBay seller that's going to respond to messages and offers quickly. What's best for the customer is a, a seller that is going to ship out items same day or one business day handling time. What's best for the customer? Free returns. That's All of those are what's best for the customer. What's best for the customer? Sending them a coupon and giving them a deal. Sending them an offer unsolicited and giving them offers to watchers. All of that is what's better for the customer. None of that is not being attentive, throwing up crap listings and trying to get all the money plus $10. That is not best for the customer. So one massive thing that you and I offer that really makes a big difference is we offer a huge selection. That is really, really good for the customer. Why do people go to an all-you-can-eat all buffet? More choices. Right. And that is super important today, but that's going to become very important tomorrow. Once they start allowing us to send bulk coupons and we have all the selection and we're allowed to market to our previous customers, having all the selection is going to become very important. It's very difficult to be in everything store and a guy who bought a DVD combo from you and you send him a coupon for 20% off and you have toothpaste and you have iPods and you have hiking boots and you have a cowboy hat, it's very difficult to have that customer come back and give you repeat business because that's a one and done customer. All they did was buy your VCR DVD combo. If someone bought a Tommy Bahama shirt from me and I send them a very nice coupon with a very nice message, letting them know that I have a hundred Tommy Bahamas in their size, that customer is more likely to come back and shop with me if he had a very good experience. So there is also a difference in these customers that you're going to experience based on how your store is. If you have an everything store, that's most likely a one and done customer. I have repeat customers every single day. I have customers that shop with me 30 days out of the month. And by having the selection, it's not selection of just total items, it's selection of the same items. So you can have a repeat buyer with a DVD store, 
but I don't think you can have a repeat buyer with a DVD VCR combo store. This is interesting. The, the one and done eBay knows that a lot of the buyers are one and done. They're trying to help with that, with the coupon. Mm -hmm. Totally. And you know, the one and done customer is the most expensive customer for eBay to acquire. That's right. Because they get all the money. A repeat buyer, the cost for customer acquisition is zero after they've already acquired the customer. That's why when a customer comes to eBay and they have an issue with the, with the item and it's a bad seller who wants to argue with them on why they're right and the customer is wrong, that's a bad buyer experience. And that, that cost eBay a lot of money in acquiring a customer that is never going to come back. Free returns, the cost of customer acquisition is already done. That's an eBay customer. Giving them a hassle-free response, if there is an issue and letting them know, no problem. I'm more than happy to accept it back anytime in 30 days, totally for free. Simply open up a return request. I'm happy to send you a prepaid label. eBay is going to reward us in the long run for providing that kind of service to the customer because eBay can go out and acquire more customers with this money instead of using this money to acquire the same customer a hundred times every single day. Customers that shop with me, repeat buyers, eBay doesn't need to spend money on them to market to them to come back to ebay.com. So that's why they've put the investment into creating coupons, into creating these promotions that they've acquired the customer. We've done a good job. They don't need to spend money acquiring this customer anymore. Let's spend money on infrastructure so that tech and sports or daily refinement can retain the customer on their behalf. And if the customer is happy with daily refinement, they can go back to daily refinement store and they can purchase from them at no cost. It costs you because you have to send the coupon, but that's not a cost for eBay to acquire that customer to buy from you. It's more eBay fees because you're giving them the incentive of buying from you again, instead of not giving the incentive of buying from you again, just you lose the 20%. eBay still makes their money. You know, you made a really good um, point in the beginning of the podcast with the focus of the CEO changing. If you remember, maybe a year, year and a half. The focus of the CEO did not change. The CEO changed. Oh, that's right. The yep. CEO changed. Yep. The previous CEO, if you remember, he was all about new customers. Because Just you total customers. Yep. So he can go to his investors and say, we're up 2 million customers this year. That's it right. It didn't matter. Just total customers. Even the tactics were different because if you remember, there was like a 20% off coupon site-wide. A couple of times they had those coupons pop up publicly because yep. they wanted people to buy the first time yep. on eBay. So you can see how that shifted dramatically. Yep. And those coupons site-wide eBay was eating that and they were, they were spending millions and millions of dollars acquiring those customers to send them to us. We would receive full price. eBay would um, pay the rest of the money to us. But now with the coupons, now it's smart what they're doing because we're the one that loses the 20% on the 20% off coupon. eBay gets an added fee on another sale on a customer that may have not have come back. So you know, if, if you want to send out your flyers with your coupon code, that's a great thing to do. If you want to message your buyers with a coupon code after purchase, that's a great thing to do. Um, they're going to install the coupons in bulk, which is going to be great. You, you better bet your bottom dollar. I will be sending out coupons like crazy once those come. Because I know I have a huge advantage because I have all the same items that that person just bought. Mm -hmm. I don't just have one of them. So every single customer that bought from me is a potential lifetime customer. As long as I still keep delivering and still keep offering the same service that I did to them the first time. Because eBay did a study where buyers who left a negative feedback as their last feedback left, those buyers on average, did not come back to eBay. Buyers who left a positive feedback, those buyers would come back to eBay. But if their last feedback was a negative feedback, 
those buyers tended to not come back to eBay. That's another argument for selling things quicker because it's going to come back to you. If eBay sees that you're delivering an experience that's positive, people leaving a positive feedback, that might translate the sales for your overall store. And if you sell a gold medal item for bronze pricing, you should be getting a really positive experience and feedback. Right. And that customer will come back and shop with you because they know they can get a gold medal item for a bronze price. And not only that do they know, everything that we talk about applies for this long term. If you have a listing goal every single day and you have customers that are coming back looking at your store and they know that you're going to list 20 new items every single day, I don't want to come back and look at your store and you haven't listed anything for a week. I've already looked at it. I've already looked at it twice. I've already come back three times. There's nothing that I want. But if I come back in a week and you list 20 items every single day, there's 140 new opportunities for me to use this coupon that you gave me. So the consistent listing goal is going to be huge. The coupons is going to be major, especially coming into Q4. Um, all of this stuff that we talk about, that we practice, that we preach is just, it's going to translate into more sales. It, it is not, there's, there's no way that you can continue to list more of the same kind of items with the same kind of quality listing and send out coupons and not attain repeat buyers. There's no way that that's going to happen. So I was reading through your feedback. And um, I can summarize what 90% of your feedback is, which is great deal, quick shipping, as described. That's like 99% of your feedback, which is all eBay needs. What can they ask for beyond that? that that's it, man. If you can offer a great deal as described with fast shipping, I think that's the name of the game on eBay because if you look at the detailed um, seller rating, that's everything in a nutshell. The only one that is not included in those three things is going to be seller communication. And if you didn't have a problem, they didn't have to communicate with you. And that's not going to be part of the feedback. But, you know, item as described, shipping costs, shipping time, those are all the things that pertain to the feedback. And those are the three most important things, the other most important things is going to be your customer service and communication, mm. but that doesn't apply to every single customer. That only applies when there's a question or when you have to attend to some sort of issue, which is also very important. So I guess there, there's great deal, quick, great, or quick and affordable shipping as described and great communication. That would be right. That would be a stellar five-star experience. If they asked the question, you responded quickly. They made an offer. You accepted the offer. You shipped the same day. They got it quickly, earlier than, than expected. And the item was exactly how you presented it. Correct. And riddle me this. Does the listing quality report take all of those things into account when they rank our listing? They even take into account on how long you literally ship the item and how long it takes for the item to get to the customer. Mm -hmm. All of that stuff is accounted by eBay. All of that stuff is accounted by the customer. And all of those things should be our 100% full focus when we're listing items, when we're sourcing items, when we're responding to customers, and when we're running our eBay business. That is all that matters. It does not matter what we think. It does not matter our opinion. None of that matters. It does not matter what you would do if you were a buyer. It doesn't matter. Those are the only things that matter inside of the listing quality report. If you are not exceeding the top 10% in your category, everything else that you're doing does not matter because eBay is not measuring it. They are telling you what they are measuring. If you're doing something else, it does not matter because it is not being measured. That's right. All the things in that listing quality report are, are all the things that we focus on in this group. And that's how you sell things faster. That's literally how you increase your velocity is by just delivering on the basics. And eBay gives you the basics. It's accurate description, shipping speed, reasonable shipping cost, 
communication. That's interesting that they put reasonable shipping costs. They don't put free. They put reasonable because they understand reasonable is good enough. Reasonable is all you can ask for. And if you do offer free shipping, coincidentally, your um, your DSR is five out of five automatically by eBay. And it doesn't allow the customer to rank you on that. So, you know, as long as everything is affordable and the customer is getting a deal, that's all that matters to eBay at the end of the day. That's all that matters to the customer at the end of the day. And you can build a solid, rock solid foundation on those principles alone and probably just the last five minutes of conversation that we've had, if you followed that only, you could build a rock solid foundation for a very successful eBay business. Agreed. That's all the basics summarized. So anything else that you want to share with the Patreon members? This is a Patreon only pod. You know, just thank everybody for tuning in and thanking everybody who's in the Facebook group. So, you know, all the calls have been going great. Michelle did a great call today about women's clothing. Her calls have been excellent. But, um, you know, maybe if the Patreon, they don't know, maybe they just run down the schedule that we have. So you do a morning call Monday through Friday. Um, we have a toy call on Monday. We have a shoe call on Tuesday. I do a call on Tuesday night. Michelle does a call on Wednesday for women's clothing. We also have photography help on Thursday, bookkeeping help on Thursday. Uh, we have a jewelry call on Friday. We have Jack who does an Amazon Bolo call also on Friday. And then we have the five podcasts that we do and the, um, the 24 hour workroom where anyone can just go in any time of day, you know, talk, figure out anything that they're trying to work through and just, you know, get that work experience. So other than that, the group has been going great, zero drama, everybody working towards the same goal. And, um, you know, everyone that even helps out and pitches in and answering questions, you know, they follow the same kind of procedures and guidelines that we preach. So, you know, all the information is top notch, factual based information, no speculation. And, you know, I'm very proud of the way that everyone has taken the lead and is practicing the same things that we're doing. So, you know, it is a very powerful movement when we have this many people all working towards the same goal. And I just want to let everybody know that, you know, both of us, we both appreciate everybody for their effort and their time that they're putting into their business and the results are showing. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week.